Take your Bibles, I invite you to go to the book of Matthew, the 6th chapter. Matthew chapter 6. While you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard of a disease called Pica's disease? Anybody ever heard of that? Pica's disease? It's a really strange disease. It's very rare, actually. It's a disease in which the people who have it crave to eat that which is unedible or something that is not nutritious for us. And there have been people diagnosed with this rare disease. I really didn't know much about it until I read up this week on it. I saw it somewhere and was reading on it. And people who have been diagnosed with this rare disease, they, they crave things that are odd. They crave things like uh, wooden toothpicks. They crave to eat things such as dirt or chalk or coal, soap, paper, rubber foam. Isn't that strange? As a matter of fact, there was one case where a guy reported that, um, that his wife was diagnosed with this rare disease, and she loved to eat cigarette ashes. Isn't that crazy? And she would follow him around while he smoked cigarettes with cupped hands, and she would catch the ashes, and she would eat them as, as he smoked cigarettes. She would, isn't that strange? I thought about that, and I thought, you know, in a similar fashion, we're born with spiritual Pica's disease. Because as humans, we naturally crave things for us which are not beneficial for us. We naturally crave things for us that are spiritually unedible, so to speak. And it's just part of who we are. It's ingrained in our sin nature. And so it's just something that we do. Man by nature craves things for their lives. We crave things to worship. Today we're going to talk about coming to terms with idols in our life. Look with me in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. Jesus said there in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where th thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. And we end at verse 24 where Jesus says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's go to God again. And prayer. Father, we come before you this morning to give you thanks and praise. Thank you, God, for the beautiful weather we have. The beautiful Lord's Day to come. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come into your house and to worship. And today, God, we pray that we would take these moments to, to examine your word. And by the mirror of your holy word, may we examine our hearts. May we with all new clarity see ourselves for who we are. May we be as the natural man beholding himself, seeing what manner of man we are. And Father, may by your spirit, may you divide our hearts and help us to, to cleanse our lives and become what you would have us to be. Father, help us not to be divided. Help us to be uh, unified in our bodies and our minds and our spirits, focused on you with our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. May today we set aside anything, anyone that comes between us and you. And may our hearts and our lives be solely dedicated to you and your service. Help us, help us by your strength to be transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray it for your honor and your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It is man's nature to worship something. Kerry Schmidt in his book called Done, he wrote this statement. He said, the fact that human beings all over the planet Earth intuitively worship something is proof that God has written this on our hearts. It is a part of our spiritual genetics. No matter where you go, 
you will find every man worshiping someone or something. And some of you say, well, what about the atheist? Well, at the end of his quote, he says, even for the atheist who denies God's existence, chooses to worship self, and self becomes God, end quote. It is man's nature. We inherently desire to worship something or someone. And oftentimes we seek that which is tangible. You see there in the picture, you see a picture of a golden calf. And I'm sure, I'm sure that, that picture is probably originated from the story from Exodus chapter 32. When the Israelites were, were waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. And they were getting a little anxious and and Moses hadn't come back, and, and they went to Aaron, his brother, the high priest, and they said, Aaron, uh, we need you to build us a God. We don't know what's happened to Moses. We don't have any direction. And Aaron ignorantly stands up and says, yes, I can build you a God. Bring me all your earrings and all your gold and all your rings, and, and I'll build you a God. And the Bible says he threw, he threw the gold in the fire, and then he took a graving tool, and he fashioned it after the image of a golden calf, which is something they would have gotten back in Egypt where they had just left. And they held up the golden calf, and they said, This be the God that brought us up out of Egypt. And they began to worship this God. That's the nature of man. Man wants tangible things that they can hold on to, that they can touch and feel and worship. But let's say, let's say for argument's sake that you, you don't worship a tangible idol. Let's say you don't have a golden calf in your living room or a statue of Buddha. Can you still be idolatrous? Everybody go like this. Absolutely, you can. And today, we're going to come to terms with idols. And God has spoken and written on my heart some things. Idolatry in the Bible is the equivalent to spiritual adultery. It's spiritual adultery. Sixteen years ago, my wife got really lucky and married me. Amen? Amen? She asked and asked and asked, and I finally gave in and said yes. We gave ourselves to each other. We stood before God and man, and we made vows. We made vows that in sickness and in health, and for better and for worse, for richer or for poorer, it's been mostly poor, it's been mostly bad health, but uh, we are still together. We made vows that we would forsake all others, forsaking all others, holding only to the one to whom I'm making this vow. Now, had I entered into that primary relationship with my wife here on earth, and she is my primary earthly relationship. And then I allowed other women to come into my life, and I said, honey, I I appreciate the vows you made, but i got a few dates i got to go on this week. I'll see you next weekend. That's going to go over like a lead balloon. And if I had allowed other women to come into my life and take away my time, take away my attention, And to take away my affection, now I have breached the vows that I have made to my wife. And friends, listen. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. When when we enter into a relationship with God, we enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, who, who the Bible calls the heavenly bridegroom, by the way. He's called the heavenly bridegroom. There's a great marriage supper going to be taking place, talked about in the book of Revelation. We, his believers, make up the bride of Christ. He is the heavenly bridegroom, and we are the bride of Christ. And when we enter into that relationship, and I make a vow, and I say, I realize that Jesus has given his life for me, and I give my life to him. And then, and then I allow the things of this world to come in and rob my attention and my time and my affection. Listen, I have committed spiritual adultery by bringing idolatry into my life friends and we do this all the time I said we I didn't say you do this all the time I said we do this all the time Matt does this all the time that's why we have to come to terms with the idols in our lives in like manner we do this with God and the Bible tells us explicitly that we have clear vows in Matthew chapter 22 verse 37 when Jesus was asked what is the first and great commandment They said this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 
And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Everything that I am is to love God. And when I allow other things to come in between God and me, now I have a problem with idolatry. It doesn't have to be a golden calf. We have entered into the realm of spiritual adultery. So I want to think about a few things today. First of all, let's think about the presence of idols in our lives. One of the bittersweet miseries of the Bible is that it forces me to examine myself and to confront my own spiritual weaknesses. It, it forces me to. That's the reason why many people don't like the Bible. That's the reason why many people won't pick it up and read it. It's the reason why many people reject the Bible as God's Word because then they have an excuse to not read it because when I read it, it forces me to examine my heart. It is that mirror in which I, as a natural man, behold myself in it and I begin to see with all new clarity that there is something in me that needs to be fixed. And it shows me the presence of idols in my life. Now, I want to think about a few things here today in the idea of the presence of idols in our lives. First of all, think about the subtlety of idols. The subtlety of idols. Isn't Satan, isn't he clever? He doesn't often walk up to the front door and bang on the door and say, hey, I got something for you. He slides these things into your life and he does it very subtly. In our text, Jesus is dealing with the attention of the believers and the affection of the believers. He said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth, treasures on earth that they get stolen. Moth and rust doth corrupt, thieves break through and they steal. He wants people to have their attention and their affections turned on to eternal things. He said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. But most men and most women today are more concerned about the things of earth and the things of this world. And we're consumed, we're consumed with the things that we have here. That's why Jesus said, don't, don't be concerned about the treasures of earth. Be concerned about spiritual things. People have their minds and affections turned toward all of these things and never giving much thought to eternal, eternal things, eternal rewards. But you know, it's not just money. It's not just money and possessions that men worship. It can be anything that comes between God and me. It becomes anything that becomes between God and me and then begins to consume. Let that word wash over you. It begins to consume me. It consumes my attention. It's what I think about all the time. It's what I think about when I go to bed. It's what I think about when I rise up. It's what I think about throughout my day. It's what I'm focused toward and, and what I can't wait to get to. What I can't seemingly live without. Anything that can consume me and consume my thought life. Oftentimes, these things, these idols are subtle. And they slide into our lives. They're usually things that kind of slip up into your life and slowly drag you away step by step. And you don't even realize, oftentimes we don't even realize how far we've gotten until we take a step back and say, wow, that's where I used to be. And look at what is consuming me today. It's the little things in life. For some, it's not things, but it's people that they worship. Parents can idolize their children. Children can idolize celebrities. Christians can even idolize their pastor. It always embarrasses me when people do that, you know. It's just embarrassing when people idolize me like that. It makes my face turn red. But they do it. People, you think, well, that's the silliest thing ever, but it happens. Let me read you a story. Henry Ward Beecher was one of the great preachers of the 19th century. He was ill one Sunday, so a substitute pastor walked up to the pulpit as service began. Seeing that Dr. Beecher would not be speaking that day, many in the crowd began to get up and walk out the door. As they did, the substitute preacher turned around and said, all of those who came to worship Dr. Beecher today, you can leave now. 
But for those of you who came to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, you may stay in your seat. To which all of them came back and sat down. People worship pastors, spiritual leaders. They, they either they hinge their going to church or not going to church upon who the preacher is. Well, if the church had a different pastor, I would go to that church. We don't worship pastors. We don't worship people. I love my children. I love my wife. I don't worship them. I am to worship the Lord God, and nothing is to come between me and God, not even my own family. He said, he that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, friends. That means I don't, I don't have to hate my family. It just means that God comes first. And what did I tell you before? When God comes first, everything else comes better, doesn't it? God makes me a better husband. He makes me a better father. He makes me a better friend. He makes me a better pastor, a better friend, a better leader. We have to prioritize. It, it can be something subtle like that. Think about the severity of idols. Idols in our lives, they don't just stay minor things. The things that we allow into our lives begin to consume us. I told you to let that word wash over you. Things can begin, can begin to consume me. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I am a, I'm a person, I'm an all-in kind of guy. My wife hates this about me. I can't do anything part way. If I pick up a new, a, a new recreation, I want to do it all the way, do it all the time. I can't do it part of the way. I get consumed by things very easily. So I have to be careful and guard myself. Now, I want you to stop for just a moment. And I want you to think, yeah, that's a baby crying. You never heard a baby cry? Everybody stop listening to the baby cry. Okay, it's a baby. Everybody stops and looks. Where's the baby at? Are we done? Okay. I want you to stop and consider the things. Because I'm, I'm asking you to examine yourself today. So we're getting real serious today. So I'm examining myself. Matt had a long, hard look into his heart this week. So I'm going to ask you to do the same. Stop and think about the things that have consumed you this week. Now, I understand it's the first week of school, so that consumed a lot of us, didn't it? But outside of work, outside of school, what consumed my thoughts? What consumed my time? What consumed my attention and my affection? To where did I go to spend the remainder of my time that I did not spend at my job? To where did I go that I found the peak of my joy and the depth of my sorrow this week? There, friends, is where you will find the idols in your life. He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. I found myself this week sorrowed by things that don't matter. They don't matter, relatively speaking, to eternity. And I had to check myself and say, what is consuming me? Now, maybe, I, I'm sure none of you have ever been where I am. I agree with Brother West. This is a very pious-looking crowd. They do look very self-righteous right now. Some of you should look like, like me, sorrowful. But I had to check myself this week and say, why is my heart burdened by this so much why is my joy heightened by this thing so much here's the question that haunts me why is my heart not more burdened for the things of God amen is it just me am I alone in this battle you can amen me if you agree or if you're having the same struggle that I have why is my heart not more burdened for the things of God why is my heart not burdened for my lost neighbor like it ought to be? Why am I so burdened by the things of this life that mean nothing? Why am I so concerned about them? And why do they bring me so much joy? He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Do you know why our heart is not on the things of God most of the time? Because our heart is so fixed on the treasures of this earth that moth and rust 
doth corrupt. And where thieves break through and steal. That's why our heart is not fixed on the treasures of God. The presence of idols in our lives is dangerous. It can be something that's even good. It doesn't have to be something immoral. You know, most of our idols that we have in our lives are amoral. They're not good or bad. What we do with them makes them bad. You can be fixed on good things. If you looked over in Luke chapter 10, I won't take you there for time's sake, but if you went to Luke chapter 10, you would read a story about Mary and Martha. And Jesus comes to their house, and, and the Bible says that, that Mary was cumbered about with much things in the house, but I mean, Martha was cumbered about with the things in the house, but Mary went to the feet of Jesus, and she sat there to hear his words. And Martha went to Jesus and wanted him to rebuke Mary for not helping her around the house. Now, is it wrong to do housework? Of course not. But when Jesus is in the house, what's in the house, what's happening in the house is not nearly as important as being at the feet of Jesus Christ and hearing from his words. Not nearly as important. She has chosen the best part. It won't be taken from her. Martha was doing something fine. She was consumed with the things in her home when she should have been consumed with Jesus. It's just amazing to me how easily I can get wrapped up in things. Our propensity to other gods, J.J. Packer described it like this. He said, what other gods could we have besides the Lord? Plenty. He said, for Israel, there were the Canaanite Baals, the jolly nature gods who worship with, with rampage of gluttony and drunkenness and ritual prostitution. He said, for us, there are still the great gods of sex, shekels, and stomach, an unholy trinity constituting one god, self. And the other enslaving trio is pleasure, possession, and position, whose worship is described as the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Football, the firm, and family are also gods for some. Indeed, the list of other gods is endless for anything that anyone allows to run their life becomes their God. He ended his quote by saying, in the, in the matters of life's basic loyalty, temptation is a many-headed monster. We must we must be aware of the presence of idols in our lives. Number two, think about the power of idols in our lives. And in verses 22 and 23, Jesus goes on to describe how this can happen in dealing with our vision. He said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. How this happens, the light of the body is associated with the eye. And this is a concept that is based off an ancient idea that the eyes were the windows to which the light enters your body. But what happens to us so often with our eyes is we start going through a downward spiral. And the downward spiral begins like this. It begins, first of all, with a distraction. It begins with distraction. Jesus said, if thine eye be single... This, this indicates a devoted purpose, a devoted vision to one purpose. A single eye is a fixed vision on a single goal. Having one eye, not divided, but one eye fixed on something. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that we as believers are to be looking unto Jesus Christ, the author, author and finisher of our faith, friends. Our eyes are to be fixed on Jesus. And let me tell you what happens is we, we don't lose all of this out here when, we, when we're looking at Christ. It's when we take our eyes down off of Him and we have a distraction in our lives that it begins to go away for us. It begins to go wrong when we take our eyes off of Him. If our eye was single and fixed on the Lord, we wouldn't have any problems. The problem is there's distractions that come in our lives. And I don't know about you, they didn't have ADHD when I was a kid. That wasn't even heard of. Anybody? You remember back in the days before Ridlin, there was paddling. Y'all remember that? <laughs> like, don't give him three Ridlin, give him three paddling, and he'll be all right. That's how I got to be so tall. 
My mom was my first and second grade teacher. And back in, back in, this is how we did it back at the house. When you got a whooping at school, guess what? You got a whooping at home. And when your mom is your teacher, it's kind of hard to fib about that before you get home, isn't it? <laughs> but we get distracted. Back, back before ADHD, I had it long. I invented attention deficit disorder. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember now what I was talking about a while ago. And I mean, I'm the kind of guy that I can be talking to you and something over here will happen and I'll go, whoop, squirrel. <laughs> and there I go. I, I kind of preach that way. I have, to really, I have to really focus in order to not do that when I preach. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I'm consciously doing it right now. And I cannot stop myself. It's amazing. It's like a bad dream. But that's how we are spiritually, too. We come to church on Sunday. We get all fired up. Brother West preaches. Brother Sam sings. And, man, we, we get our eyes on Jesus, man. And then Monday comes and distracted. Something else catches our eye in this world. Idols are powerful. It begins with distraction. Then it leads to division. He said, if an eye be evil, that gives the idea of a divided eye. One looking different directions. We're trying to keep one eye on God and one eye on the new object of our affection. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus and not be divided in our vision and in our attention. You say, well, can I, I can't do anything else, Brother Matt. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you make sure that you prioritize in your life where things belong in your life. Where they belong. And if we'd be honest, if many Christians in today's society would be honest we would have to admit that God is usually pretty low on the priority list. And everything else is pretty high. That's why churches are empty on Sundays. That's why churches are closing down. That's why churches in Broken Arrow are having to merge. You know, we don't have a Presbyterian church in Broken Arrow anymore. Do you know that we had two Baptist churches had to merge here recently because one had a pastor and one didn't have a congregation? One had a building? Why is it? It's because the American Christian has become so distracted and so divided in his life that God has really dropped down on the priority list. And we've allowed other gods to come in. We don't recognize them as idols. That's why we're coming to terms with idols today. We don't recognize them as idols. We say those are our, our hobbies. But boy, if we would really examine that, we might find that we're wrong. How much does my heart hang on that hobby? Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What you treasure, what you treasure is where your heart is going to be. This division leads us to deception. We become deceived. If an eye be evil, this is not something mysterious or devilish, but it's rather it's the eye, it's the eye of deception that causes the viewer to mistake the identity of the object that he's viewing. He becomes deceived. Satan is the father of lies and he's a master deceiver. He subtly brings things into your life. He's never changed. He just brings these things in and he allows you to, to look at them and to, to touch them and to feel them and then all of a sudden he realized all he had to do is step back and we become so consumed and we don't even realize what we're holding in our hands. We're so deceived. We don't even realize the gods that are in front of us. And all of these three right here lead to the last and final part of that, that powerful thing. That's domination. Domination. This is where we, all caps, must be careful. Because these things that I mentioned earlier, those things are amoral. They're not bad. Having a family is not bad. Playing football is not bad. Having Facebook is not necessarily bad. But we must be careful. Because anything that dominates me, listen, becomes my God. 
I want to take you somewhere. I skipped Luke, but I ain't, I'm not going to skip Romans chapter 6. I want to take you and show you this. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. It says there, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. And those that are alive from the dead, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members, your body, as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now go down to verse 16. He said, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Do you see that? To whom you yield yourself servant to obey, you become his servant. Some of us, our bodies are our God. My belly can be my God. Listen, friends, my body works for me. I don't work for my body. It works for me. I have to tell this piece of trash to get out of bed every morning, don't you? I had to tell it this morning, piece of trash, get out of bed. You work for me. And many of us yield ourselves to our bodies. My body, I've, I've had to learn how to bring my body into subjection, and I'm not doing very good. When I see that red light at Krispy Kreme, man. <laughs> Whew, have mercy. Because you know they're going to give you a free one if you walk in there. See, that's how I see it's subtle. It's subtle. They just, oh, would you like, would you like a free donut? Yeah, I'm like, oh, thanks, Satan. Appreciate it. <laughs> you think, well, that's silly. No, listen, friends, our bodies can become our gods. We can worship our body, and I can, I can yield myself to my body all the time. Listen, in America, especially, especially in America, because we deny ourselves no pleasure. None. No pleasure. If I want it, I get it. I live in America. That's making my body my God. I'm to bring my body to subjection. We have to be very, very careful. Whatever you yield yourself to, it becomes your master. That's why we have to be careful about the things that people think are, are small things. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to meddle, but I'm going to give you an example. And if this is you, then I'm not, I don't know who you are, and I don't know that this is you. So don't be so easily offended. But my grandfather was a chain smoker. A chain smoker. And I watched my father, my grandfather give his life over to that. And, and, you know, and people look at something like that and they go, well, that's a minor thing. And it is. It is a minor thing. But here's the problem with minor things. They don't stay minor things. Minor issues become major issues. And then those minor things that became major now become master. Do you see how that happens? My grandfather, I love him. He died on Christmas Eve 20-something years ago. My grandfather lived every second of his life. You listen very carefully to this because this is truth. He lived every second of his 61 years of existence for his next cigarette. Every, every trip he took, every time he went to church, Every time he did anything in his life, it all revolved around when could he have his next cigarette. A little white piece of paper filled with a leaf controlled his every thought and every moment and every action. Doesn't that seem silly? You think, oh, Brother Range, you're just being overdramatic. No, I lived with the man. He slept in my room when I was a kid. We didn't have a big enough house for me to have. I never had my own room. Now I can remember rolling over at 3 o'clock in the morning and seeing him get up fumbling around for that cigarette. Had to, have, had to have his cigarette. Had to get up and make a burnt offering to his God. Amen? It dominated his thoughts. You say, well, I come to church every Sunday. Yes! And Congratulations! But does God consume any of your thought and affection any other time? But what does? And if you can, if you can come to the answer pretty quickly, then you've found your idol. So let's talk about, lastly, the purging of idols from our lives. Very quickly, I'll move rapidly. I'm out of time. 
She said, take your time. You don't, don't say that out loud. You get stoned right here. <laughs> Just be like Stephen and smile when they do it, okay? The purging. Now that we have come to terms with the idols, and listen, it could be a job. It could be anything. Now we have to figure out what to do about it. And purging means to cleanse something, to clean it out. To purge your garden means to go in, get the thistles out, get the thorn, the, go get the rocks out. Purging. And so let's talk about this. How do we deal with the idols in our life? First of all, there must be awareness. Awareness is recognizing that at any moment Satan can bring something else into my life to consume my attention and try to deceive my mind to draw me away. Be aware. Be aware of what you bring into your life. Be alert to what may be happening to your heart. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. You must be aware of what is happening to you. And I don't know, and so and so doesn't know, but you know. And you must be aware of what's coming into your life and what you're allowing into your heart and into your mind. Number two, not only must there be awareness, there must be acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is what is happening right now. In case you did not know, that is what's happening in this moment. It's the moment of clarity in which I take a long, hard, honest look. Honest look. An honest look into my heart and into my life. And I say, there it is. There's my idol. There must be acknowledgement. What do they say in the 12-step program? You must first admit you have a problem, right? The first step is to admit you have a problem. In order for us to purge the idols from our lives, we have to acknowledge that they exist in our lives. And I want to tell you something, friends. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. And it should. Because we're going to rip something out of your life that means so much to you. But we'll replace it with something that's going to mean so much more. The God of heaven should mean so much more. The Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, should mean so much more. There must be acknowledgement that this has taken over. Verse 24, he said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot do it. I cannot say I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus and then I'm going to serve all these other things. It can't happen. You'll either hate the one and love the other, or you'll hold the one and, and, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and then be tied to all the material possessions of this earth and say, I have to have this, 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 and this in my life. When I look in the scriptures, those who followed Christ forsook their nets and straightway followed him. That's what we have to do. Thirdly, there must be action. Once we're aware and once we acknowledge, we must act. There must be action. Let me close by taking you to another passage of Scripture. Colossians chapter 3. Now I want to show you something. I hope you're listening. I know you're all going to write in that last blank and you're going to shut your Bibles, but please don't do that for the love of mercy. Just because everything I've said, I, I, I said it to bring it to this point right here. Colossians chapter 3. Are we going there on that screen? There we go. Look at verse 1. He said, if you then be risen with Christ, if you're, if you're risen with Christ, if you're a born-again believer, seek those things which are above. Amen. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. That kind of goes back to what Jesus said. He said, lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth, right? For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now look at verse 5. Here's the action that must take place in our life. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Which is idolatry. He said, mortify your members. Mortify them. The word mortify there, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you ought to just walk up to your idol and say, listen, it's not you, it's me. It's not you, it's me. I really, I'm just going to have to excuse you. Listen, we're talking about a deadly poisonous snake. Listen, he says, mortify your members. It means violently put to death your members. And he lists all of those things there, and he says, those things are idolatry. Put them to death. Violently put them to death. Now, I told you I'm scared of two things, snakes and women, right? I killed a timber rattler in my brother-in-law's driveway. Took all the courage I had. I didn't walk up to the timber rattler in his driveway and go, really, you're not wanted here anymore. Your presence here is alarming and uncomfortable. So we're going to have to ask you to just go ahead and go on to somebody else's driveway. That's not how I approached this snake. I went in the house. I loaded several guns. <laughs> I came out looking like Rambo. Paint. No, I, honestly, I took a hoe. I took a hoe, a garden hoe. And I approached... I approached it with caution, but my adrenaline was pumping. And I pounded that snake into 10,000 pieces with all that I had. And he's a little timber rattler. I mean, they're not about that long. And I mean, I cut him, and I chopped, and I danced. You should have seen me. I, I, I look like Jose Canseco out there swinging that hoe. That, that's how you approach your idol. That's how you mortify your members. You don't say, idol, you're in the way and you're obtrusive in my life and you're consuming me. I need you to go away. No, you mortify. Mortify your members. You violently put to death that which separates you from God. And you start today. I'm going to have our song leader come, our musicians come. We start today. There is no other God beside Jehovah God. There is no one else who has loved you eternally, who has created you and made you wonderfully and beautifully. There is no one, there is no other God besides the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and willingly laid down His life so that you and I could be saved. No other God. And because there is no other God like that, there is nothing that should come between us and Him. I want to ask you today, where are you at with Him? You cannot serve God and mammon. Is there an idol in your life? Do like Hezekiah, tear it down. Tear down the idols in your life. Examine your heart today. Listen, some of you have had a deep look into your soul today while I was preaching. and you would, you, If you were honest, you would admit it. That the Holy Spirit has divided the heart of many people in this room today. Now, here's my advice to you. Do not grieve and do not quench the Holy Spirit. You respond. And you respond by mortifying your members. You respond by coming and giving over to God what is, what is something in your life that's taking His time and His attention and His affection. You come and you put it on the altar. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, no other God died for you. No other God is standing here with his arms wide open saying, I would receive you if you would come to me. Jesus is that God. His arms are wide open. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus asked. Is this world worth it? Are the things of this earth, are they worth losing your eternal soul and being separated from God for all eternity? I don't think so. Today, come and give your heart to him. Saved person, come and give it to him brand new. Come and sacrifice idols today. Come and tear them down. Get your heart right with God today.